You know, I always love exploring strange and obscure software. From old versions of Linux to strange eBay finds, it's always one mystery after another. This time, we're diving into Microsoft's Windows NT4 Embedded, which is a special variant which, as the name suggests, is intended for use in the creation of embedded systems. While Microsoft generally offered Windows CE for use in these roles, Windows NT Embedded was offered as an alternative. I was somewhat curious to see what it was like compared to more traditional offerings, so I decided to roll up my sleeves and dive in headfirst. That led to the decision to do a live stream where I installed NT4 Embedded and explored just what was in this forgotten piece of history. Over the course of six hours, I ended up creating a few custom images, testing the provided target designer and component designer, and just for fun, creating a few crimes against web design along the way. Since my dive down the rabbit hole was deep to say the least, we're revisiting an old concept of mine known as N Commander in real time, where, with some editorial help, I recut one of my live streams into a video with new commentary and additional research. That's also why you can see my ugly mug up in the corner. With the backstory out of the way, let's dive right in. The first thing to note is that Windows NT Embedded isn't something you just pop in and install. Instead, it takes the form of multiple applications that are loaded on a more traditional copy of Windows NT. Before the stream, I took the liberty of installing Windows NT4 Server with Service Pack 6 in VirtualBox and then popped in the NT4 embedded disk. Due to autoplay, we're immediately greeted with a pop-up and a laundry list of requirements. Of these, the most relevant was that I had to install Internet Explorer 4, which brought Active Desktop along to join the party. After sorting out the prerequisites, installation took the form of a simple Install Shield installer, and when all was said and done, we're left with two new applications. These are Target Designer and Component Designer, which could be called the meat and potatoes of NT4 Embedded. To understand what these actually provide though, we need to step back and explain what NT4 Embedded actually is. The easiest way to put things in context is to look at the smallest possible installation of the normal retail versions of Windows NT. Microsoft's own system requirements list 110 megabytes of available disk space as the absolute minimum for NT4 workstation. In practice, you likely need closer to 150 to 200 megabytes, both for applications and the system page file. For those not familiar with embedded systems, that might seem reasonably small. However, by embedded standards, it would be excessively large to say the least, especially by the standards of the day. To put this in context, the easiest way is to compare this to Linux, where you can strip it down to the bare essentials of what you need. For example, it's relatively easy to fit modern versions of Linux in less than 10 megabytes while still having plenty of room for applications. This thus brings us to the heart of NT4 Embedded, which can basically be seen as an effort to convert Windows into a modularized set of components that can be included or excluded at will. The end result is that it's possible to create highly tailored systems with little to no excess bloat. However, the real question I have is just how much of Windows is actually optional? In an effort to find out, I started creating a new target designer configuration, which excluded everything but the absolute essentials. After working through all the configuration screens, I was ready to build an image, but annoyingly, deploying NT4 embedded is neither a straightforward nor intuitive process. The build and install option in the menus can write out a configured system, but instead of creating a disk image like one might expect, it simply copies the necessary system files to a given directory. To actually use the NT embedded image, I had to get a bit creative. I tried a few approaches, such as adding a new entry to boot.ini, but what ultimately worked best was adding a second hard drive to the machine and then copying the build files over. After doing so, I could stop the VM and swap the hard drives around. This made the NT embedded installation drive letter C, which immediately booted up and presents us with a single command line window in a low resolution 16 color mode. 
Given that I stripped out all the optional components, to say that there's little to see here is a bit of an understatement. Even the system font has been replaced with a no frills alternative. It's only by opening the property screen that we can see that the core of the Win32 API is still available. However, what's more impressive is that this installation is only about 10 megabytes in size. That's less than one tenth of a normal Windows NT installation. Admittedly, it's still fairly large for what is essentially a do nothing system. However, that cost is likely offset by the fact that pre-existing Windows software could be easily modified to run in this type of environment. We'll explore this point in depth a bit later, but setting up the minimal image, I found myself wanting to take a look at something else that caught my eye, specifically this option called the standard OS. As it turns out, the standard OS option is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. In comparison to the minimal command line, we now have Explorer available with all the bells and whistles attached. Since we also had the control panel available, I was able to load the VirtualBox display drivers and switch to a high color mode. Although I didn't test the standard OS configuration extensively, it's likely that any NT compatible application would run without modification in this type of environment. It also appears that most, if not all, Windows NT components are available. For example, in Target Designer, we can see that various Microsoft technologies such as IIS are listed. That being said, there's a fairly large difference between building an example configuration and deploying a real-world solution. While it's not exactly the best test, I decided to try my hand at making two more images based on hypothetical real-world scenarios. The first is a minimal configuration dedicated to running a single application. My candidate here was an unmodified version of NetHack 3.4.3 since it only depends on a handful of libraries. In contrast, the second image would be a more complex NAS-like device intended for hosting simple websites while simultaneously being accessible over Windows file sharing. Since the option to deploy IIS was already present, I decided to tackle that first. This was pretty easy in the end since it only required me to set some configuration options before our new embedded web and file server was up and running. Amusingly, IIS comes with an appropriately bare-bones welcome page for NT Embedded. To properly celebrate this relic of the early web, I used Word 97 to create a true expression of my passion for design and deployed it to NT Embedded over SMB. This eye-popping abomination will no doubt haunt the dreams of my viewers for years to come, while also simultaneously proving that Chrome and Firefox still support the marquee tag. Learning that tidbit alone made this entire adventure worthwhile. Still, all good things must come to an end, and with the crimes against good taste complete, it was time for the embedded NetHack image. This was a bit more involved since, to do it properly, I needed to create a new component to incorporate the NetHack game files. This is done with Component Designer, which is an incredibly unintuitive application to say the least. It was only after a lot of trial and error that I was able to create a NetHack component and then add it in with Target Designer. The best, and I use that term lightly, comparison I can make is that it is very similar to creating a Windows installer package, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if MSI files were in fact influenced or influenced by Component Designer. At this point, it was time to deploy the image and cross my fingers. If I did everything correctly, we'd boot right into NT Embedded and into a new game of NetHack. Obviously, it wasn't that simple. My first attempted boot just led to an error that winmm.dll is missing, which is part of the Windows multimedia system. There isn't really an easy way just to include one file, so I ultimately just copied it in manually. After a reboot, I was suddenly an archaeologist on my quest for the Amulet of Yendor. Mission accomplished. Admittedly, in a real-world scenario, I would have likely just modified NetHack to drop the WinMM dependency. 
However, it goes to show how much is actually offered even in the so-called minimal configuration. Now, I could close out here, but there are a few takeaways I want to talk about. While NT Embedded can build impressive real-world solutions, it's also incredibly rough around the edges. One of the largest problems that I ran into is that adding new drivers to target designer appears to be an incredibly daunting task. Under normal circumstances, a Windows NT driver is a set of binary objects with an inf file that includes the necessary metadata for installation. One would expect that one could just slipstream in new drivers if you had said inf file, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be the case. From the example components provided on the CD, Windows NT embedded drivers appear to directly edit and influence internal data structures in the Windows registry. Microsoft did provide the sysdiff utility, which at least makes it possible to know what entries to add, but honestly, adding a third-party driver seems like it would be literal days of effort. This isn't helped by the fact that NT Embedded also has a fairly bizarre workflow. It's almost like you're intended to deploy an NT Embedded image on a second hard drive, pull it out of your development PC, and then put it in the target hardware to test it. The best way I can describe the experience is less than ideal. It seems like, at a minimum, one would need to use third-party utilities like Norn Ghost or the then-new VMware to actually get anything done without an excessive amount of frustration. The documentation does allude to the possibility of creating a bootable CD, but even then, it doesn't document the required steps to do so. I can only assume, on the whole, many of these rough edges were sanded down a few years later with the release of Windows XP Embedded. Perhaps we'll take a look at that at a later date. It's on that note that if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing. If you really enjoyed this video, consider hitting that bell or becoming a Patreon. With that said, as always, you can follow my adventures in real time on Twitter or come hang out on Discord. Until the next time, this is your host, N Commander, signing out and wishing you all a pleasant day.